Great. I think we're ready to start. So welcome everyone to this session, which is titled How to Listen, Find Common Ground, and Engage with a Climate Crisis Skeptic, which is a part of Bellevue College's Earth Week events. You can find a full list of our events on the link that we will post in the chat shortly. For Earth Week, we are exploring topics around the theme, the future is now, which strives for a just and sustainable future for all. My name is Amber Nicholson, and I'm from the Bellevue College Office of Sustainability. Myself and my colleague, Alyssa, will be moderating this event. Before we get started, we have a couple of things to go over. You are muted upon joining, and we would like for you to stay on mute unless actively asking a question or responding to a prompt from the speaker or joining a big breakout room or something like that. If you'd like to keep your camera on, it does make for a more engaging session and helps us to build community. This event is also being recorded to post on our sustainability webpage. Throughout the session, please treat everyone with respect and share your comments and questions in the chat box. We will have a time for Q&A at the end where you can either unmute yourself or have us read out your questions. For the best Zoom experience, we recommend that you click the speaker view button in the top right corner of your screen, which will make sure the speaker is centered on your screen. Lastly, we pause to acknowledge that Bellevue College resides on the traditional and occupied land of the Coast Salish peoples, <clears throat> past, present, and future, that includes but is not limited to Snoqualmie, Suquamish, Duwamish, Nisqually, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot. We honor their connection to the region, pay respect to Coast Salish elders past and present, and stand in solidarity through their struggles with continued systemic oppression. We commit to care for the land and water and center equity at the core of our unlearning. Now, let me take a moment to introduce our two speakers today. Today, we are joined by Kent Short. Kent is an emeritus faculty member in the Earth and Space Sciences program at Bellevue College, having retired from full-time teaching in 2019. His academic specialties are meteorology and oceanography, but has focused on climate and climate change issues for much of his career. Prior to joining BC faculty in 1998, he worked for the federal agency NOIA or NOAA and several environmental consulting companies. We're also joined by Catherine Medbury Olson, Catherine is a faculty member in the Communication Studies Department at BC. She is passionate about educating and sharing tools for healthy relationships and respectful communication. Catherine enjoys the beauty, beauty of the Pacific Northwest and spending as much time as possible outdoors with her family. Thank you so much for joining us today, Catherine and Kent. And Kent, take it away. Thank you very much, Amber. And on behalf of my esteemed colleague, Catherine Medbury Olson, I would like to welcome you all to our session. Um, we wanted to do a session on global warming, science of climate change, climate crisis, but we didn't want to rehash the science of, uh, the science of global warming and climate change. That's been done many times. Um, we wanted to take a different focus today. Uh, I want to make a couple of quick points and then we're going to show you a TED talk by a famous climate scientist named Catherine Hayhoe. But first, a couple of quick points. Uh, the science of climate change has been very well done over the years and is very conclusive and compelling that we humans are the cause of this crisis. Um, that's basically all we're going to say in terms of the actual issues of climate change. Um, having said that, I think it's important to make the point that the climate science community, of which I have been a part throughout my career, has done a very poor job of communicating their findings to the public. And especially how important this issue is to everyone's life. And how to communicate that better is, is what we're going to talk about here. The science, the science community itself has, as a whole, not done a, a good job of this communication. And hopefully uh, through our TED Talk and, and some exercises that Catherine's going to take us through, we will help understand how to communicate these issues more effectively. So what I'd like to do now is I'm going to share my screen and, and uh, Amber, you can tell me if this ends up not working, but I think we'll get there. Everybody see that? Yes, we do. Okay, good. Um, this is a TED talk by 
a woman known as, as Catherine Hayhoe. She is a, a very prominent climate scientist at Texas Tech University. She holds um, faculty positions at Texas Tech in both climate science and political science. Uh, she has been a chief scientist for the Nature Conservancy, which is a, a, a non-governmental uh, environmental advocacy organization. She is the author of more than 125 peer-reviewed publications. And interestingly, in her background, she is also an evangelical Christian and advocates strongly for reconciling science and faith-based decision making. So she brings a, a very uh, unique perspective to the communication regarding this issue. So let me go ahead and start this up. Okay, thank you all. Uh, my apologies for muting the audio there for a few minutes. Um, I'm going to now turn it over to Catherine and uh, please give her your attention and she has some interesting questions. Sorry about that. How do? Um, so uh, Catherine has uh, up on the screen now, she, she shared, some, shared some questions with you and uh, take it away, Catherine. Great, thanks so much, Kent. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this important conversation. I wanted to open it up here for a few minutes before we get into some tips and tools and an activity um, to get your general reaction to Catherine Hayhoe's talk. Um, and specifically just general reactions and then also I'm curious, do you have conversations about the climate and what barriers do you see to having those conversations? I'd love to just open it up. Feel free to jump in and share your thoughts. Can I? <laughs> Please do. This hit, this hit home like hugely. <laughs> I'm so glad this woman it comes from the background she does of you know Christianity and everything and is talking science. To, I come from a background of uh, growing up in a very Christian home, and uh, I have I've changed I've I've changed a lot of views <laughs> over the years, um, but whenever I talk to, in particular, my oldest sister about climate, it can get very heated <laughs> because we are on opposite sides of the fence. And hearing someone from that background talking and taking it seriously was so encouraging. <laughs> and with the problem I have with uh, talking to my sister is there just seems to be this mindset that it's uh it's either it she she'll bring up when I, we've gotten into discussions and we just have to stop them if we want to save our relationship um is it will get into discussions of she'll send stuff that comes from a usually like a preacher or somebody that has no really scientific background and um I don't know, what is the balance even at some point between somebody that is so entrenched in an idea <laughs> that is false, <laughs> it's just blatantly false, no matter what set of facts you send them, and even, I mean, it just seems like even trying to go about it in a way of like, well, you know, we're supposed to take care of the planet because God wants us to, and all the, it's, that doesn't even seem to work. I don't yeah. know if anybody else has had those issues. <laughs> yeah, I, I appreciate you bringing that up, Ruth. Thanks that um, it can be really hard. And I think you bring up a good point when, particularly when it's a family relationship, a relationship we really care about, that can get even more complicated, right? Because we're really invested in that. Um, I'm gonna have a couple of tips in a little bit that I think you might find helpful. And then I also have a book that you might find really helpful that I'm happy to mention to the group at the end. Yeah, that specifically addresses that um, intersection between the environment and Christianity in, um, in particular. Yeah, thanks for sharing. I'd love to hear from a couple more people. Initial reactions? Do you have these conversations or not? Uh, this is Roshni. Uh, I do, oh, you can't see me. Um, 
I do have it, um, but with some of my friends um, who, not that I don't believe in God, but they believe more strongly than me, they, they do say that there is a plan, that God has a plan. I don't know really how to respond to that. I'm not about to say God doesn't have a plan. Yeah, similarly, I think a book I'm going to recommend will be helpful to many people. <laughs> Great. How about any students who joined us? I'd love to hear from a couple of you. Yeah, this is Soren. I've definitely um, had these conversations with people. And I, a lot of people that I've talked to, mainly older people like my mom or stepdad, they kind of have the mindset that it doesn't really affect them. Mm -hmm. So they don't care to really act on it. And whenever I try to engage in a conversation like that, it immediately gets politicized. When I think climate is such like a non-political issue, it's always somehow gets turned into that. So it can be hard, I guess, to find common ground with talking to them in a way where they're seeing what I'm seeing and not it's not being turned into something that it's not. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I think um, that's a common thread that I've heard from a lot of people too. It's, um, generationally, right? There can be a split there and it's hard to navigate that, especially when it's with a, a family member again, right? That, that makes it even more difficult. Yeah, I appreciate um, Connor has typed into the chat box too. Um, my grandpa doesn't believe in climate change. Yeah, so another important relationship I bet in your life and that makes it challenging. Great, well, um, in thinking about what time we're at, um, I appreciate everyone sharing those examples and I hope that you can relate to this. I think we all probably know someone who's a climate crisis skeptic and maybe we um, are attending today because we wanna figure out how do I have these conversations, right? I have some barriers that I'm experiencing and how do I navigate that? So let's move on here. So as I go through some tips, I really want you to think about these two questions for yourself. One, why does the climate matter to you, right? Like Catherine Hayhoe just talked about, what matters to you in all of this? So please keep that in mind. And second, I encourage you to think about what are some solutions that you are already implementing in your own life and what would you like to do? And so I think that those are helpful um, for us to keep in mind. So as we noted when we advertised this, class, this session, our goal is here to provide you some practical approaches and tools to help support you in having productive and respectful conversations with climate crisis skeptics. So let's go through a few tips and tools. I'm gonna to give you some examples along the way. And then after this, I have some scenarios. I'm gonna actually have you go into some small groups and breakout rooms and practice and think about how might you handle these and navigate these. So first and foremost, relationships matter. And so I really appreciate the examples that folks just gave of relationships where they find it challenging to have a conversation about climate. Our relationships absolutely matter in our lives, right? And they're a wonderful place for us to have some productive conversations, although that can be a challenge, right? Um, I think what's important is that we build trust up over time in our relationships. So I want you to remember that as we go through all of these tips. Second, the climate matters and impacts all of us, right? As Kent mentioned, and as Catherine Hayhoe did, that it's going to impact all of us, no matter who we are, no matter our political affiliation or whether or not we believe it's real, the climate matters and impacts all of us. The third thing that matters is educating ourselves. So learning, asking questions, identifying our own values and why it is that we care about the climate crisis and what we wanna do about it, right? That's why I asked you to think about those two questions a minute ago. So think of these as sort of the base for everything. So then what I'd encourage you to do is consider some non-environmental reasons for conclusions or decisions that you've made. Because I think what we're gonna find is um, when we think about um, some of the reasons individuals who are skeptical of the climate crisis will provide, um, they, they are gonna have a hard time listening to environmental reasons of why they should change their mind or why they should rethink something or why they should even consider or listen to your idea. And so one thing we can do in terms of responses is to brainstorm non-environmental reasons for those conclusions or decisions. 
are going to end up helping the environment, um, but the focus shifts away from an argument about the climate and the environment and focuses maybe on some other areas that are more palatable, maybe, or something that might um, be an area where somebody has um, greater understanding or a willingness to engage about these things. So for example, if you're thinking about diet, if you um, are vegan, you could focus on saving money and it's a healthier option, right? Rather than focusing on, and it's good for the environment. Someone might draw those connections later, but for now you could focus on those non-environmental reasons. Meatless Monday, right? Perhaps um, this is something that I've been trying to do. I grew up on a farm, full disclosure, a beef farm. I really enjoy meat, but I also recognize that's not necessarily sustainable. Um, and one of the things besides helping the environment is that I really enjoy trying new recipes and cooking. And so maybe that's an in with someone that you could share that trying this out could be an, a fun option for someone. Um, using less paper at work could save a company money. Composting can help my flowers and my vegetable garden grow. Um, I have two kids. I like to use used kids clothes because it saves money and I'm a practical person, right? So I bet that if you sat down and thought, thought about actions you're already taking, in addition to environmental reasons, there are probably other reasons as well that may make a, a possibility of a connection with someone. Next, I always ask people to think about what their goal is anytime we go into an interaction with someone. And so in this case, when we talk about the climate crisis, <clears throat> perhaps we want to be right, perhaps we want to prove our point or change someone's mind, um, but I would encourage you to shift that thinking to having a goal of understanding another person. Now, understanding does not mean that we agree with them. However, if we take the step of trying to understand someone, we can often have a much more productive conversation and someone might end up changing their mind or changing their behavior in a way that may positively impact the environment. So I recognize this is really a tough place to start, but I do encourage you to try to shift that goal of understanding someone else. And it might be really hard because we might really disagree or they may be on a complete opposite end of something from us, but understanding and having that goal makes all the difference in the world. So how do we understand someone? The first is to uh, really listen, right? So we can ask someone questions, prompting someone. So perhaps these phrases might be helpful for you. You know, tell me more about this, or I'm trying to understand where you're coming from, right? And really approaching in a non-threatening way, but prompting someone to tell you more about them, right? You're learning about them. You're building up some of that trust and that connection. Empathizing goes a long way. So again, even if we don't agree with someone's point, we can try to understand where they're coming from and why they care about something in particular. So if someone really questions the climate crisis and thinks, you know, we shouldn't be taking these steps because it's gonna hurt the economy. We might say, well, I can understand your concern about the economy. And here are some ways that um, these changes actually positively impact the economy. Okay, or it sounds like your concerns are based on this value. Is that accurate? Right, so again, we're showing the other person, we're trying to understand them. And I was making sure that our nonverbal cues match while we're listening. So really respecting another person while they're speaking, nodding, having eye contact with them, um, not rolling our eyes, okay? So we make a connection. We also wanna make sure we're engaging in respectful conversation with each other rather than talking at someone. Right, and this is the key here, again, back to those relationships mattering. We wanna show that other person that we value them. We actually care about listening to them and learning what it is that they care about. So we take turns, we don't talk over each other. We really try to listen to understand rather than listening to attack and refute someone. So again, back to that goal of not being right, right, or getting in an argument, I'm trying to understand someone. So I'm not gonna listen just to try to attack and prove them wrong. I also want to note that it is highly unlikely that we are going to change someone's mind in one conversation. So I encourage you to think of having a conversation as one of many conversations and the aim would be to keep the possibilities of those future conversations open. Again, going back to that relationship matters. We want to foster that and we want to continue conversation rather than shutting it down. Okay, last couple here. 
no matter where someone's coming from, I think it can be really helpful once we've taken time to try to understand them to focus on commonalities and connections that we have. So what do we share? Is that values? Would that be an activity we both enjoy? And I have some sentence stems here saying, you know, I think we both enjoy this, or I also care about the economy, or I also care about humanity, right? I agree with you in terms of this. You can also then suggest ideas that match another person's concern. So if somebody cares about the economy or they care about environmentally impacted refugees, we could use that as a reason for it saying, you know, well, investing in eco-friendly technology research actually helps address those things. And again, not necessarily saying, and because it helps the environment, right? I think we have a tendency to want to do that, um, but let someone draw those conclusions, right? We're, if we're thinking about understanding and hopefully having someone change their behavior at some point, um, this can be a helpful approach. Okay, the last few things, I usually like to frame things as really positive of things we should do, but there are some things I want to make sure we don't do in these conversations. One is more information is not always better, right? Throwing a whole bunch of climate science at someone is not going to help things. It can actually overwhelm them and they may shut down. Um, second, yelling doesn't make our point any better. It actually detracts from it. So getting louder doesn't help someone hear us better. Getting into an argument is counterproductive, right? Because it can harm that relationship. It can really alienate and shut down the possibility of further conversation when our aim is to hopefully have more conversations. And finally, please avoid personal insults or dismissive behaviors like rolling your eyes um, or calling into question someone's beliefs or values or ideas. So again, we're really honoring that other person and trying to understand where it is that they are coming from. Does anybody have any comments or questions on any of those tips before we jump into some situations? Hi, Catherine. This is Doug uh, Brown. Hi, Doug. Um, I have one, uh, one suggestion here, which I think is in the spirit of your tips here. Uh, I find that one way in conversations to kind of build for ongoing dialogue and to encourage somebody else to actually listen to me is not to start off with an external agenda, but an internal one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that is, if the conversation is structured around me saying, here are things I'm thinking about, here are some things I'm worried about, here are things that concern me, then assuming we're starting off in a conversation with somebody I have some relationship with, then the the bias of the conversation becomes based on their concern about my concern. And they're having some level of commitment to engage with my concern uh, in a productive way. Uh, if that's the starting point and the way of proceeding, then, then, then that builds in from the outset a little more sustenance for the conversation. It also helps me not fall into the trap of being polemical or, uh, or uh, 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 argumentative. Mm -hmm. And uh, that can make a big difference. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, I think that idea of whatever it is that we need to get in that real state of mind of like, I want to understand, I want to engage with you. Um, that can be really valuable. Yeah, thank you for that example, Doug. Great. Yeah, and I also appreciate um, the point that Connor made about using I phrases. Definitely. Yeah, I think that is so valuable, again, of not attacking someone like, you said this, right? Um, really, I'm hearing you saying this, right? Or I'm understanding this can be really valuable. Great. Well, let me highlight um, one other thing. Um, Actually, you know what, I think I'll do this at the very end. I think we're going to do some examples. And then I actually have some common um, approaches, commonly expressed ideas that we can get to at the end if we have time. If not, I'm happy to share this PowerPoint. All right, so what we're going to do is I'm going to invite you to go into breakout rooms for about five minutes, so real brief time. And I want you to think about these tips and tools and any others you might have. And think about how might you approach each of these situations. And I think I have about eight of them. I don't expect you to get through all eight of them. But as a small group, I encourage you to pick a couple of them 
and think about how might you have a conversation about these? What are some things you might want to do and some things you might want to avoid if you're in a conversation with someone and they say this? Okay. So I'm going to put these into the chat so everyone has access to them. And then I'm going to invite you to go into a breakout room. So you're going to get a little notice and you can go ahead and click and join the room and I'll bring you back in about five minutes, but go ahead and chat through a couple of these and how you might handle them. For those of you still on the call, you should have a little prompt that says that asks you to join the room so you can click on that if you're able to. Catherine, are you going to stay here or are you going to hop around to breakout rooms? I'm probably just going to stay here. Okay, then I'll go join a breakout room. Okay, cool. Thanks, Amber. Oh, hey there. Hi. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> Ming, are you here also? No, we have oh, two. yeah, yeah, I'm here. Yeah, I'm here. Yeah. Hi. So um, I, th I think that this is a we're supposed to chat about how we'd approach each situation that Catherine put into the chat. Ming, uh, you didn't get put in two different groups, did you? I noticed you had two different screens or two different accounts? Are you in two separate groups? Well, maybe. Well, you and I can just chat about this. I'm not sure if it's still recording on, on our screen. So let's go through the exercise. You're on, you're on mute. Yeah, so it's recording on my computer. Okay. So how would we approach each situation? The first one is this is just going to hurt those that are those who are poor. People need to access affordable and reliable energy. Okay. It's so hard. I'm <laughs> these are tough. Myself. Yeah. Yeah. Um especially when you agree with the statement, but I think it could be done in a more tactful way, just less aggressive, maybe. Yeah, I think I, I would, yelling at somebody. Mm -hmm. I would say, I think that there are advanced, I'm assuming this is talking about like solar and, and wind, mm -hmm. or something like that. Mm -hmm. Saying that coal and oil is cheap and soil and wind's more expensive, maybe. I'd probably be like, well, there's been advances in technology lately. Yeah, the benefits to having reliable and affordable energy for people and, and what that means for sustainability. Um, yeah. yeah, that cost is coming down. Yes. And that actually, <clears throat> that could in the long run actually become more affordable and more reliable and also not have a negative impact on, you know, air quality. Mm -hmm. Things like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, stuff. Okay. Yeah, this will destroy jobs. Um, it's hard not to just throw facts at people, you know? Yeah, it is. Um, I think like what Catherine was saying, um, like say the pop, put the positive spin on it, like what jobs will it create? Instead of saying like what jobs it will destroy, tell them how many you know jobs it will actually create for people and give people more opportunity. Um, and then, you know, show like positive economic benefits. Totally. Those scientists aren't legitimate sources of information. Well, mm -hmm. something just popped up on my screen. Oh, 50 lead breakout rooms in 50 seconds. Anyway, I think that, yeah, we were talking about how, yeah, just to, to kind of meet them where they're at try to understand what what sources of information are they using and, and seeing what what they might be reading and 
Yeah, that's a good idea just to get more information on like, yeah, where they are getting their resources, maybe say, you know, share where you're getting your resources and why you rely on those. Like, for example, I often go on to Fox News just to see what Fox News is saying about an issue. Totally. Just to get the other side of what might be being said. Yeah, yeah that's important. Cool. Well, good breakout. Okay. Yeah, we'll, I'll see you in the main room. Bye. Bye. Thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> well, welcome back, everyone. I hope you had a chance to practice a little bit of this or even just talk through the challenges that we associate often with sometimes when we are on the receiving end of some of these comments. Right? And Kent and I were talking just a minute ago and I realized, you know, when we're so passionate about something, for instance, um, you know, the environment, which we often see as a life and death thing, it's really easy for us to be so invested and so passionate that it's hard to step back and take a, a moment to listen to someone else. So I do want to highlight one thing, if I can go back, um, because several of you brought this up. And so there's some commonly expressed ideas, and there's a really great book, I'll, I'm happy to provide the title in the chat, um, by a woman named M. M. Frances Bloomfield. She is a communication scholar, and she wrote a book specifically about communication strategies for engaging climate skeptics, um, dealing specifically with religious arguments. And so it's, it's really, I think, very respectful and thoughtfully done. Um, so there's a few tips I wanted to provide, especially since many of you brought this up. Um, there's three common areas um, that she identified as um, sources of arguments or skepticism, if you will. Um, so one would be many people might see a battle between environmentalism and religion. So they might see evidence as not being compatible with their beliefs, and they perceive this as um, a hostile idea or an enemy. And so questioning this becomes a personal attack on their faith. And so I think understanding that can be really valuable and help us think about how might I approach someone from that perspective of finding common ground and understanding someone's values and seeing that there probably is some overlap with values. Second, um, we may see people have a real narrow focus on evidence that they see as legitimate. So they might cast doubt on peer reviewed science or different authorities. Um, or offer other possibilities and conclusions of scientific research that doesn't necessarily match with the majority of research that's been done. So again, the importance of finding ground, a common ground there and providing some concrete examples for individuals. And finally, I think it's also important to remember that skepticism can come in the idea of apathy in terms of someone being skeptical that they can do anything that would matter, right? They might very much believe that there's a climate crisis, but they might think it's just too overwhelming, right? What, as, what can I as one single person do that would even make a difference? And so the importance of understanding that perspective, because each of these is distinctly different, but I think it's important in all of them, we take time to understand someone and foster a relationship, um, but there are some different approaches we might take, which I've suggested here. Okay, so we're close to our time. Kent and I are happy to stay for a few more minutes if anyone has questions. But I did want to end with this idea. It says, no matter where our beliefs come from, we share a common duty to write our current disruptive role in the human nature relationship. By listening, opening ourselves up to new perspectives, and being willing to engage, we may change the world. At the very least, we may have more conversations, both speaking and listening, with that end in mind. And so as you leave today, I encourage you to think about what is one concrete step that you plan to take after today's session. And I encourage you to put that into action. Right, so thank you so much for being here. And like I said, thank you, everybody. Thank you. We're happy to answer questions you might have or anything you want to chat about. Feel free to unmute yourself or leave a question in the chat. What was that book again? You, were, you said you might put it in the yeah, chat. Absolutely. I will type it in right now. Thank you for reminding me, Ruth. Mm -hmm. I've got a question. Yeah. Forgive me if some of the uh, tips and, and things did address this because I'm, I'm doing a little bit of juggling, but um, First off, thank you so much. I am in my environmental politics class. I'm having students have a conversation a week with somebody. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, this is really important work. And just speaking personally, I'm interested in tips for breaking the ice. 
um, not even anticipating conversations that are going to be adversarial, but of just conversations with peers and family and, and in community where it's basically like, what I'm thinking is before I fell asleep last night, I was just filled with a sense of existential dread uh, about the climate. What do you think? Like that feels like mm -hmm. a hard way to break the ice. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, or other thoughts that I commonly have are, you know, it seems like we're not being militant enough in the face of reactionary politics. What do, what do we need to do to overcome these power structures? I mean, I have a mm -hmm. lot of, thoughts that I think are hard to break the ice with other people. Yeah, I appreciate that a lot, David. That can be tough. And especially with such big issues, right? They're, they're so complex. So I would say, I think it depends on the relationship and the context, quite honestly. So if you've had some of these other conversations along the way with someone, I don't think there's a problem with opening up with one of the questions that you just had, right? One of those really deep ones right away. Um, if not, I think it's helpful to just ask about questions. I mean, it'll be a little more general, like, you know, I've been thinking about a lot of stuff about, you know, what um, my impact on the environment is, for example, or, or I read this article, what do you think? Right? I think sometimes that can be a really great in um, to have a more general focus of something you've been thinking about or say, you know, I really appreciate our conversations. I mean, I appreciate your insight on things. What do you think about this idea? Okay, here's what I'm thinking. I'd love to just have a chat with you. Yeah, or like I said, or a I read something, I saw this article, what do you think? Um, that can be a great way to engage someone. I have a thought here on which I'd, I'd be eager for people's feedback. It's not as though I have uh, uh, a recipe, but um, I think, in some kinds of conversations, one way perhaps to be focused and concrete enough to make progress is to identify an area of shared concern that is in the public sphere and particularly something that people cannot escape in the news and can't escape feeling that they have some responsibility to at least be aware of. Um, and one that fits I think particularly here is uh, the climate migrant crisis. Now, the key here, I think, is that most folks, if they think about it, have to be concerned about large-scale migration from Central America. I think most of us can't delude ourselves that we have anything like an answer to suggest, and therefore a conversation can be an actual shared attempt at brainstorming problem solutions, provided that one can, can judiciously bring the conversation around to recognition of the, the climate disruption roots of migration, uh, together with all the ancillaries that go along with it, the threat multiplier aspect of which the the, the collapse of, of governmental and social structures in Central America uh, is exacerbated by crop failure and so forth. Um, uh, so I, I wonder if one way to handle some conversations is to try to, to, to bring that shared challenge of figuring out how we as a country deal with the now I think inescapable looming migration crisis that uh, almost none of the political actors claims to have a solution for, except for the most mindless and, and, and failed ones. Yeah, again, I think about like, what's the context, right? Like how, where could we have those conversations, right? Maybe that's a, a great problem solving challenge in a class, for example, right? Um, or maybe, uh, you know, for instructors to come up with some kind of a case challenge like that to talk about a big issue and breaking down the complexities. Um, and giving people agency, right, to think about what could we do or what are some groups doing? How could I get involved? Um, and for students, I think it's maybe picking topics in a class, right? If you're, most students have to take, say, a research writing paper class, right, an English 201, um, or maybe you take a public speaking class. If you don't, you should, my little plug for that. Um, but you usually get to pick your own topic in classes. So pick one of these topics that you care about, really learn about it and explore 
um, the complexities in what it looks like. It could be a chance for you to educate yourself and engage with something and educate your classmates as well. Yeah. Great, I think we have time for one more question if anyone has one. If not, like I said, feel free to reach out to myself or to Kent and thank you so much for coming. I appreciate that. I think attending something like this really shows your care and I hope that you will feel empowered to have some conversations um, about issues that you really care about. And thank you so much, Catherine and Kent for your time today and for your insightful tips and for that, uh, for the YouTube video that you shared, the TED Talk. I know we've all learned something new that we'll take with us as we work for a more inclusive and sustainable future for all. A reminder to all attendees, thank you for coming and check out the rest of our Earth Week activities uh, via the link in the chat. Thanks again. Thank, thank you, you all. Have a great week. Bye. Thank you.